Sí, pero... Sí, ya te digo, venga. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bill Donahue, and I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies in the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. And it's my pleasure and honor to serve as your host, uh, along with my friend and colleague, Patrick Griffin. Uh, we're really delighted to see so many of you out here. I happen to be in DC this week, which is our fall break, uh, with my students, uh, many of whom are here today. A group of bright and committed young women and men who want to make a difference in the world. They are graduate students in the Keos, in the Keos School's Master of Global Affairs program and undergraduates with majors as diverse as political science, philosophy, and finance. So much in contemporary politics, frankly, drives me to distraction and despair. But when I look at them, when I look at you, I remind myself that you are the future, and I am heartened and truly consoled. At Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs, we endeavor to place the concept of integral human development at the center of our work. This notion challenges us to put into practice the values of inclusion, solidarity, community, and the inviolable integrity and dignity of each human being. This is a tall order, and frankly, not easily applied to the messy world of global affairs. For how exactly does one promote inclusion, solidarity, and a holistic view of human flourishing in the face of the protracted nightmare of Brexit? Britain's exit from the EU has us talking constantly instead about division, new customs borders, and possible walls. It causes some to pit national, nationalist, and ethnic interests against the common good, and it encourages zero-sum competition rather than mutual gain and cooperation as the model for international affairs. So where do the two, integral human development on the one hand and Brexit on the other, where do they meet? Well, fortunately for me, as your mere host and convener, I have the privilege of articulating the intractable problem, but I don't have the responsibility of solving it. <clears throat> that is the, the task of our illustrious guests. But I will preview the discussion with one observation. When I spoke yesterday with Ambassador Mulhall and with Amanda Sloat this, ver this morning in this very room, they both assured us that Brexit and its aftermath, regardless of the precise form it may take, will be with us for the foreseeable future. Now, before I introduce the panel, uh, I want to offer just a few words of gratitude. The genius behind this event, and I really want to stress that, and behind most everything we do here, is Maura Povicelli. So thank you, Maura. She is assisted ably by Carla Burgos Moron, who joined the office just a few weeks ago, but somehow seems to know everything already. She's the real expert. In South Bend, we convened a working group back in August to prepare for this evening. It includes Dr. Heather Stanfield, Melanie Webb, Grant Osborne, Ty Lavers, and Kevin Fai. To them, we owe a great debt of gratitude. And now, to the event itself. Uh, as I uh, call out your name, I would ask you to stand and then come to the stage and take your seat. Uh, first of all, uh, His Ex Excellency Daniel Mohall, Ambassador of Ireland to the United States of America. <laughs> Senator Chris Murphy from the great state of Connecticut, who is member of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Europe and Regional Security Cooperation, as well as the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. <laughs> Congressman Peter King from the great state of New York. He is co-chair of the Friends of Ireland Caucus and, and this is very important, a distinguished alumnus of Notre Dame's law school. <laughs> I will be out of your way in just one second. Dr. Andrew McCormick, Northern Ireland Civil Service Director General for International Relations. <laughs> <laughs> 
and Dr. Amanda Sloat, Senior Fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe, in the Center, excuse me, on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Tom Wright, who serves as director of the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. Tom is also responsible for organizing the entire week of our seminar, so I want the students to know that in advance as well. Tom Wright. Max is now going to remove his podium, and Tom, the mic is yours. Great, Bill. Thank you um, so much, and thank you to Maura and to the Kehoe School and the Nanovich Institute for all of the terrific work that you do and for putting on this incredible event with such an illustrious uh, panel on such a timely topic. Uh, as well uh, here today. I, I think it's the, the school is a great addition in Washington, D.C., and I know this is not the first uh, event I've done with you, and I hope it won't be the last, and we very much welcome uh, your contribution here uh, to the discourse in, in, in Washington. So we have an incredibly timely topic, I think. I mean, when we initially started talking about this, with the Halloween deadline looming, one assumed... Uh, one assumes that that's interference from opponents of the deal, I'm sure. <laughs> um, one assumed that it would be uh, somewhat timely, but of course, uh, with the developments of breakthrough last week, the trouble that the Prime Minister ran into over the weekend, um, one really has to keep up minute by minute. In fact, in the room just beforehand, people were swapping uh, information from Twitter about just whether or not there would actually be an election uh, in a few weeks and what that meant for a deal. Um, but I will just give a brief uh, recap maybe of where we are. Um, after months um, of taking a very hard line saying that the United Kingdom would leave the EU without a deal and that the EU would have to back down on every major point, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson a couple of weeks ago after a very consequential meeting with the Irish Taoiseach uh, Leo Varadkar uh, changed his position and quickly came to an agreement uh, that was substantially different in some ways uh, to the backstop uh, that was agreed upon before, but was similar perhaps to another version of a deal proposed by Theresa May, uh, the former prime minister in December 2017. The agreement was concluded uh, relatively quickly, but then over the weekend on the first Saturday sitting of the House of Commons since the Falklands War, uh, we ended up really back in a familiar position, which was there was no uh, there was no majority for anything really in Parliament. Parliament voted uh, for the Letwin Amendment, subsequently voted uh, for the deal, but then very quickly voted against a timetable. So if you're confused, join the club. I think people who, who, who work at it full time are, are, are <coughs> unsure as to where things um, stand. So what we'd like to do is to really have a conversation about the deal, but also about what it means really for uh, for Ireland, uh, for the US role uh, in Europe and in Ireland, um, and for future relations between Ireland, the United States, uh, and the United Kingdom, and the EU going forward. And I'd like to start uh, maybe with, with Ambassador de Mahal, uh, if I could. And, and it's really the same question for all of the panel, which is, from where you sit, what do you make of uh, this deal? Uh, you know, Ireland was very, uh, steadfast in saying there could be no departure from the backstop. Uh, this is quite different, um, but it does seem to respect those um, red lines. So if you could just maybe tell us a bit about how this looks uh, from your perspective. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's my second uh, night running in, uh, at the uh, Notre Dame campus in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and it's great to be here, as always. Um, we never wanted the U.K., to leave the European Union. Um, I was in London during the referendum campaign and I followed the whole thing um, for months before and then for a year after the referendum. And our position was quite clear from the very beginning. We never wanted Brexit to happen. We accepted that the referendum result had produced a majority in favor of Britain leaving the European Union. And then we sought to, we had two aims in the negotiations that took place over the last few years in order to, to agree a withdrawal agreement 
um, between the EU and the UK on the terms of their withdrawal and then a transition period and a blueprint for future relations between the UK and the European Union. Our two principles were to minimise the damage, the economic damage for the Irish economy, which is still very closely connected with its our nearest neighbour in the UK. And secondly, uh, to um, protect the Good Friday Agreement and to avoid any question of the imposition of a hard border on the island of Ireland. Now, we would have been happy to go along with the, uh, the version of the deal you mentioned, which was initially floated uh, in, in the discussions between uh, Prime Minister May and the European Union. Uh, we were also willing to go along with the, the backstop as it emerged uh, from those discussions when the, the original Northern Ireland only backstop was dropped. And we're willing to go along and welcome um, the, the, uh, the present deal as well. Because in all of those cases, those sets of arrangements and the current arrangements that are in this new protocol on Northern Ireland respect our red lines. In other words, uh, they, they guarantee that there can never be a hard border on the island of Ireland as a consequence of Brexit. And also, they provide a pathway to concluding a future economic relationship between the UK and the European Union, which, of course, is an open question where that, will, where that pathway will end. But that's a matter for negotiation between the two sides. Our hope would be that in a year or two from now, when this um, uh, agreement on future relations is concluded, that it will entail a very close economic relationship between the UK and the European Union, because that's the best way in which to, to ensure, to, uh, to minimise the damage to Ireland, to our economy, to the European Union, to the UK, and in particular, to the economy of Northern Ireland, which obviously is closely tied up with um, both the UK and uh, the Irish economy. Um, so the new feature of this agreement, which is, um, was a compromise um, on our part, is that there will now be a role for the Northern Ireland Assembly four years after the agreement comes into force. The Northern Ireland Assembly will have the opportunity uh, to, um, to say yes to a continuation of these arrangements, which by then will have been operating for four years, and we believe smoothly and effectively in a way that, will, that would minimise uh, opposition to them, or indeed to reject those uh, arrangements. So it, this, this does give the Northern Ireland Assembly a new um, role, and therefore it increases the importance of the Northern Ireland Assembly getting back to business. And that's why we hope that this agreement can be ratified in the coming period. I'm not going to say when exactly, because that's a, an open question. And that when that happens, that there'll be an immediate move, we hope, to restore the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement so that the Assembly can do its work in monitoring um, the uh, arrangements that are being put in place for Northern Ireland and also um, ensuring that the, uh, the North-South and the East-West elements of the Good Friday Agreement's institutional framework can also be brought back into action. Thank you. Um, Senator Murphy, you, you've uh, been uh, a strong sort of critic of, um, of a, a no-deal Brexit that would jeopardise the Good Friday Agreement, and you wrote a powerful op-ed uh, not too long ago talking about the dangers of a hard Brexit, not just for um, Northern Ireland, but also more generally. I'm wondering from how you look at it, is this deal a significant improvement, and do you think it's sort of a viable path forward? Well, first of all, um, you know, my interest is not in telling uh, Britain or its citizens what's best uh, for them. Uh, our interest in the United States Congress is looking out for uh, our own national security interests. Uh, and uh, I think that under any agreement, the departure of Britain from the European Union is bad for American national security. And I think we should make that as clear as day. I think right now the risk is trying to get dragged into the details of the exit, and there are certainly some versions of the agreement that would have been worse for U.S. national security interests than others. Uh, 
But the fundamental truth here is that uh, the post-World War II order, which we should never take for granted, uh, in which nation-on-nation -nation conflict is uh, very rare, and at least in Europe, uh, since um, the establishment of uh, the modern EU and NATO, uh, non-existent, um, that we shouldn't sort of presuppose that this order hangs around for the next 50 years. Um, I spend a lot of time in the Balkans, and I remember being there uh, several years ago at a particularly troublesome moment. A drone had flown over a soccer match in Belgrade and dropped into the field of play a uh, map of greater Albania, which is uh, not something that, that Serbians like to see in the middle of a football match. And uh, there was so much anger over it that the prime minister of Albania canceled his historic visit to Belgrade. And it looked as if this was all going to fall apart. Uh, and then they realized that if they started yelling at each other and they started getting at each other's throats, then Europe might not come calling. And they put back on the calendar the historic um, summit between the Serbian leader and the Albanian leader. And they did so because they wanted to be part of Europe. And they wanted to put aside their own rivalries to be able to stay on a path to join Europe. And so when Europe is weak, um, all of a sudden, places that can become very unstable very quickly, where wars tend to start, where lots of US troops exist and might exist in the future, um, become more unstable. Uh, and so um, I, I, I don't think there's any agreement that ends up with Britain leaving the European Union that we should be celebrating here in the United States. That being said, um, it clearly is a US interest to protect the Good Friday Agreement. And I would agree with the ambassador that the bottom lines that uh, Ireland put on the table and the friends of the Good Friday Agreement put on the table um, have, for the time being, been met and that uh, we, we could, we, we at least in the short term, not see an abrogation of the Good Friday Agreement. And that's certainly a security interest of the United States having been um, a party to th those negotiations. Uh, but I um, still remain deeply worried uh, about the weakness of Europe, um, about the cheerleading that this administration has done um, uh, to Britain's departure. Uh, and the danger that may come in other nations down the line uh, starting to use this model. Thank you. Um, Congressman King, you have also been one of the, one of the leaders, really, in the Congress um, with uh, Speaker Pelosi and, uh, and Congressman Neal on uh, emphasizing the importance of the Good Friday Agreement as part of this Brexit uh, process. I was wondering, how do you look at it, could you speak maybe also a little bit to the bipartisan nature of the concern sure. in Washington on Brexit and how it affects Northern Ireland? Yeah, first of all, it's great to be here. It's great to be back at Notre Dame, even if it's a few hundred miles away. It's great to be here. Uh, my wife is here from St. Mary's, so we got you covered on both ends. Uh, I see Kitty Higgins is here from the Clinton administration. I remember her during the whole Irish peace process and the role that she played. Uh, I, I first went to Belfast in 1980, so I'm dating myself. I never thought we'd be in the position we're in today, whether it be uh, peace on the ground, or at least calm on the ground. And uh, having been there during the Good Friday Agreement with Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, George Mitchell did a phenomenal job. Uh, and also St. Adams and McGinnis and Trimble and all of them working together to bring about something no one ever thought would happen. And there was a US interest even then, because this was the only war raging in Western Europe at that time. Basically, I had this war, you can go back 800 years, 30 years, 20 years, whatever it was. The fact is, we had our closest ally engaged in a violent struggle on the island of Ireland, and it also carried over to the mainland. So it was really in everyone's interest to resolve this, and I don't think it could have been done without President Clinton. He was basically the honest broker in all this. And that was, I think, the glue that, held the, that brought the Good Friday Agreement together in the first place. And, has held it together since then, the idea that we would be a guarantor. Now, how you define guarantor would be different, I guess, maybe different people, but we have a real role to play here. And I would say that you can take the assembly, you can take the uh, uh, reform of the police, you can take the British troops leaving Ireland, you can talk about human rights reforms, all of that that came out of the Good Friday Agreement, but I don't think anything was more important symbolically. And in Irish history, symbolism becomes reality. And that was the uh, uh, do, uh, doing away with the border. I mean, I have cousins in Limerick, I have cousins in Galway, I have gone back and forth to Ireland more than 30 times. And I can tell you, prior to the Good Friday Agreement, I don't think you could find 
maybe more than one or two percent of the people in the South, except maybe those right along the border, who would even think of going to Belfast. And you certainly wouldn't find people in Belfast or Derry City who would think of traveling down to Dublin. So the fact that now people go back and forth routinely, they go on shopping sprees, they go to sporting events, they go to cultural events, they go to school on both sides of the border, and they don't even consider it a border. And to me, anything that would bring back any even symbolism of that border, even just a customs post, I guess it was back in 1956, it was a customs post that was attacked by the IRA. So, I mean, these are 56, 58, whatever the year was. Uh, in fact, that was Sean South, who was a neighbor of my cousin's in Limerick City. He was the one who was killed and he became immortalized in the song from that. So, symbols mean so much. And uh, maybe unless you were there at the time, unless you would see what it meant on the ground to have that border there and what it meant to be stopped at the border and uh, going both ways and, again, uh, it just divided. It was two different people living on the same island. Now, they go back and forth as if it's nothing. I remember talking to Ian Paisley before he died, talking about his recent trip to Dublin with his friends Bertie and Jerry, and I couldn't believe I was here. He's talking about Bertie Hearn and uh, Jerry Adams, which whoever thought you'd hear that. So this deal, I think, is better than we could have anticipated, considering uh, you know, the impact of Brexit, what it meant, considering how reliant the Conservative Party is on the DUP. Prime Minister Johnson to be able to bring about this agreement, which basically means there will be no border. There will be no hard border at all. To have the border in the Irish Sea means people can still go back and forth in the N1 from Belfast to Dublin, from Dublin to Belfast. And that, to me, will do more to uh, allow the generations to continue to grow. I, every year since I've been in Congress now, 27 years, I've had uh, university students from the North in, interning in my office. And the first seven, eight, nine years they were there, whether they were from the national side, the Republican side, the Protestant side, the Catholic side, whatever you have, any term you want to use, all they thought about, all, they knew every atrocity, they knew every detail of what was going on. They could tell you everyone who was killed four blocks from their house and whose uncle was in jail. That's all they lived and died for, and they were afraid of dying for it. Now, when you talk to university students, as smart as they are, they talk about the struggle in the North and the that long war that was going on. It's like us talking about World War II or World War I. It's ancient history. They don't live with it. They're talking about getting a job. They're talking about buying property. They're talking about raising families. And so to them, the border psychologically is non-existent. So that's why I think this is so important what happened. And anything we can do, and uh, you mentioned the bipartisanship in the House. I know uh, Congressman Neal, Speaker Pelosi, and I both said that we would resist any trade agreement between the U.S. and Great Britain if there was a hard border in Northern Ireland. So to the extent that may have had an, uh, any influence on this new agreement, well and done, but I think it showed that the U.S. has a continuing interest in a positive way, which was started by Bill Clinton, and it continues in the Congress today. Thank you. Um, Andrew, you are not a politician. You are a senior civil servant in Northern Ireland, the Director General for International Relations. Um, so. I was wondering if you can tell us maybe how this, uh, how this deal, this tentative deal is being received in Northern Ireland and what the different perceptions are in the different communities and political um, groupings and how they sort of believe. Is, some people have said this is actually a great deal for Northern Ireland mm -hmm. because it gives you sort of a foot in both camps. You can have access to the UK market, access to the European market, but obviously there's a lot more at play than the pure sort of economics. So could you talk us through that maybe a little bit? Well, thank you for the way you put the question, Tom, because having been uh, a thousand days without ministers as a civil servant, uh, I have to be respectful to the uh, views that will be taken by our uh, once and future ministers. Um, <laughs> and the reactions have varied. As you say, we had the foreign secretary on the radio last week, the day after the deal was announced, saying it's a great deal for Northern Ireland uh, because it gives us access to the single market and the customs union as if when he's the leader of, or a, a leader in a, in a government taking the rest of the UK out of those relationships. Uh, when I hear from Dan's colleague in Brussels, I was in Brussels on Tuesday for just to keep myself updated with work there and Dan's colleague there said to me, um, um, don't you realize that uh, Belgium German regions are looking at what Northern Ireland will get in this deal with concern. Is this too good? Is this too beneficial? Uh, the, the concern, the big concern that has emerged, and this is very important, uh, I really ap ap appreciate so much the support and goodwill from here, but the, the point that is concerning at the moment is that we have uh, up close to half of the leading politicians in Northern Ireland very concerned about this because 
it creates a border, a border in the Irish Sea, is the perception, is it a matter of, is that a, a proper interpretation of the deal? I think that's questionable because uh, the nature of what is needed between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK in the proposals is potentially manageable. And that's what I think the focus of attention has to be on. Can this be made to, to be truly respectful of the uh, element of the Good Friday Agreement that is Northern Ireland's place in the UK? That's what the DUP is saying is threatened. They're concerned that any barrier uh, to movement of goods, anything, and of course, the unionism didn't feel that comfortable despite despite the, the incredible security that Good Friday Agreement gives to the union. It's never been f felt strongly that way among the unionist community in Northern Ireland. That, that's obviously my personal background, but I'm, I'm a neutral civil servant. Uh, but there is a, a genuine concern that this weakens Northern Ireland's place in the UK. So working on that, I think for that, for, for that People to be sensitive to that issue is very, very important as we look at this because uh, that's why they're asking for uh, not only what's been given in terms of uh, the, the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly, they're looking for something stronger. Now, that to go further would not be consistent with the Good Friday Agreement despite what they're saying. The, the, the fact of the matter is that this is not governed by the provisions in the agreement about cross-community voting that's, it, that's not the legal or political position on that, on the, on that, that as a matter of fact. Uh, but still, there's a concern. And to me, for this to settle properly requires some confidence building, something that builds a more coherent and, and consensual approach. It's not been the style uh, in the way this issue has been handled. And that's part of where it's, to me, been more difficult than it had to be. But I sense from the European institutions, and as, as I say, I, I take my time with them as best as I can, but also the goodwill here, something that, it, that fulfills the feelings that were around in the 1998 agreement where people were, were seeing a bigger prize, seeing a need to come together, and your influence as, as, as America on that, in a, that remains potentially very, very significant. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just reminded of, of a point you were making earlier about some people welcomed it as a as a very good sort of economic deal, and there were German regions that were mm. concerned. I'm reminded that when Theresa May presented a version of this deal in December 2017, the first people to oppose it, if I remember correctly, were the Mayor of London, the Mayor of Newcastle, and the First Minister of Scotland, all of whom said, why can't we have that deal? <laughs> because they wanted access. Uh, to the customs union and single market too. Um, my, my colleague Amanda Slode has been following Brexit extremely closely and I think is probably more responsible than any individual in America for keeping Americans appraised of what's happening. Uh, you should all read her, her various posts on, on, the, on the various developments over the last two and a half years. But Amanda, I was wondering if you could maybe feel free to offer your view of the deal, but maybe also to reflect on what you've heard here as well where you think this is headed. Is this a deal that is likely to be agreed and to stick and to succeed? Um, or are there sort of real uh, you know, concerns still out there? I thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here, even though I'm a Michigan State grad. Uh, oh. I, I feel okay hanging out with the uh, with the, the Notre Dame crowd. Um, so, as as Tom said, I have been following uh, Brexit extremely closely, and part of this stems from a very deep personal interest in this. I lived in in Belfast for three years. Uh, I moved there a couple of years after the Good Friday Agreement uh, and a week before 9/11, uh, and it was actually a really profound place to experience 9/11 because it was a place. That that it had very real experiences with domestic terrorism. Uh, and so for me, uh, I, I feel a, a quite strong emotional attachment to the place. And so not only have been following these debates from uh, an intellectual and an academic interest, but also a deep sense of concern about what's been happening there. 
In terms of, of thoughts on, on the deal itself, I'll just offer um, three quick reflections. Uh, one thing that strikes me about the protocol for Northern Ireland as compared to the backstop is it's a permanent arrangement rather than an insurance policy. Uh, so if you remember, the backstop was only supposed to come into effect uh, unless uh, there was not other arrangements that were, were put into place. I think so one thing we need to consider about this is what this is going to mean as a permanent factor rather than as something that was only an insurance policy. The second thing is how the institutions that were set up as part of the Good Friday Agreement that exist in Northern Ireland, that exist north, south, and east, west are going to operate. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on the consent mechanism, on the way that the assembly is, is going to vote on this uh, four years after it comes into effect. But there's less consideration about how the assembly is going to participate in the joint committee that is set up between the UK and the EU and some of the other institutions that are set up to monitor this. I want to underscore something that, that Andrew said, which I really think is not recognized enough in Washington, which is that Northern Ireland has been without a government for almost three years, which if you stop and think about that is extraordinary. I mean, it's for like us in, in the United States, if the Virginia state government hadn't functioned for the last three years, and, and what that would mean in practical purpose. Um, I met with the, the group of, of Notre Dame students this morning, so they are now experts on, on Brexit. Uh, and one of the, the anecdotes I shared with them from when I was last in, in Belfast was that I was talking with an Uber driver. Uh, and he was telling me, uh, Uber drivers and taxi drivers are always the best barometers of public opinion anywhere. Uh, and he was telling me that there had been a trial period where Uber drivers could use bus lanes for a year as a way of managing traffic. This one-year trial had ended, and nobody was able to take a decision about whether or not Uber drivers could continue operating in, in bus lanes. So it's a small and pretty simplistic example, but it illustrates what is happening in Northern Ireland when you don't have ministers that are in place to take these decisions. And as Andrew mentioned, there's only a certain amount of decision making that civil servants want to do without having ministerial oversight to be able to take some of these political decisions. There had been talk in London about the need to reimpose direct rule if there was going to be a hard deal Brexit, which is also quite politically contentious and I think would be a step back from where the, the process has been going. The third thing I would say on the deal is there is the potential for concern uh, on unionist side and I think more generally about what's going to happen in terms of alignment between Northern Ireland and the rest of Great Britain. Uh, one of the fundamental challenges that the UK faces with Brexit that simply is the reality of things is that the more closely aligned the UK stays with the European Union, the less friction you're going to end up having on the Irish border. The flip side of that is the less scope the UK is going to have to negotiate free trade agreements with countries like the United States and elsewhere. So the UK ultimately is going to have to make decisions about how they want to align in regulatory terms, whether it's much closer with the UK or whether it is closer with the EU um, or with, with the EU or, or, or with the US. If they decide to start deviating in regulatory terms from the EU and align much more closely with the US, for example, making compromises on things like agriculture, on genetically modified foods, that is going to create distance between Northern Ireland and the rest of Great Britain. And I think this is something that could potentially have consequences uh, in the longer term. I, in terms of, of how this all plays out, I, Tom is always encouraging me in the stuff I write to make predictions about what's going to happen <laughs> in my best guess of, of things. Uh, and I always tell people I feel like I'm enough of an expert on Brexit to know that it's impossible to predict uh, what's actually going to, to happen on, on Brexit. Um, and it's, it's very hard to see. I think we are likely uh, going to see some sort of extension. So for all of us who are blocking out the days before and after Halloween uh, to watch what was going to happen on Brexit, I think we can celebrate and, and trick or treat and, and not have to uh, worry about something immediately happening on this. Uh, but all things are, are still really um, up in the air, I think, in terms of what the potential outcome is and the potential for a deal. I think if I had to put money, I think there eventually uh, will be a deal that, that gets through. If you look at how Boris Johnson is, is doing in the polls, uh, the unpopularity of, of Jeremy Corbyn in, in the polls. Uh, but this certainly is continuing to create a great deal of uncertainty for businesses operating in the UK. Uh, and it really is affecting the operation <coughs> of politics on the ground in Northern Ireland.
Thank you. Uh, maybe Halloween is saved, but Christmas might be at risk. That's right. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, the break of war on Christmas. Um, yeah, Ambassador, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about this has been, it hasn't quite opened the Pandora's box, but certainly things have been put on the table for discussion and that weren't maybe on the table before. So, you know, unionists are worried that part of this deal may lead to an economic union in Ireland that they see, you know, it's a slippery slope. Various politicians on both sides have talked about things like border poles or, you know, reinforcing Northern Ireland as part of the UK. I was wondering if you could just reflect a little bit, you know, from, from your position and from Ireland's perspective on how this sort of Brexit moment fits into the larger sort of story of the post-Good Friday agreement and are, is there, are there any assurances that unionists could have in what Andrew said in terms of how they're perceiving it, you know, that there's not going to be an attempt to sort of bounce them into United Ireland and, or, or what, what do you see as sort of the, as the situation uh, on what would be called in Ireland sort of the constitutional question of, of the status of Northern Ireland going forward? Well, our, our, um, our Deputy Prime Minister, the Tonishta and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade was in um, Belfast for the uh, Belfast Chamber of Commerce annual dinner um, the night before last. And he gave a very strong and I think quite detailed uh, speech outlining the, um, I, I just uh, tweeted a, a link to it on my Twitter account at Dan Hall, so you can all read it. But it's well worth reading because he deliberately went there and he was accompanied by the chairman of the Dublin Chamber of Commerce and the idea was to try and talk up the, the Belfast-Dublin corridor, which is obviously quite important economically for the future. But here's what he said at the, at close to the beginning of his speech. He said, it's important to say that this new EU-UK agreement affirms in black and white the constitutional status of Northern Ireland as set out in the Good Friday Agreement. It also affirms that the principle of consent will continue to apply, namely that any change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland can only come about through the consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. This is set out in the very first operative article of the new protocol. So I suppose the reason the minister went to Northern Ireland uh, this week was to, to provide those assurances, to, to, to make it clear. And, and by the way, he also said that we were, we were reluctantly embracing this agreement. We would have preferred other arrangements to have emerged, but this is the only arrangement that seems to be possible. And therefore we were, with a certain heaviness of heart, and the same is true, of course, within the European Union generally. Nobody wants to see Britain leave the European Union and just to to amplify what Senator Murphy said, um, the European Union has been a gift to transatlantic and European security and prosperity for the last 70 years. And the loss of a major member state like the UK is a, is a significant <coughs> blow to that community of nations that has developed links over the last 70 years. And by the way, there's also an economic dimension for the United States because nobody I know believes that Brexit, any form of Brexit, will produce an economic plus. The question is how big the minus will be. And that's a matter for decision, a matter that only history, uh, that only time will tell. But any loss of economic growth for the UK and the European Union will have knock-on effects for the United States, which is a major investment and trading partner with the European Union. So what I would say is that, that our government will do everything in its power to provide reassurance to Northern Ireland unionists. And the minister did, did make the point that there's going to be a need after this thing finishes, whenever that may be, to reach out and to rebuild some of the links that have been, have been strained over the last few years within Northern Ireland, between North and South, and between Britain and Ireland. Because undoubtedly, this has been a difficult period. Ironically, it came after a period when relations between Ireland and the UK had never been better. In the period, say, between the time that Queen Elizabeth visited Ireland in 2011 and I had the pleasure in 2014 of hosting our president when he made a first ever historic visit, state visit by an Irish president to the UK. So we've gone from a plateau of 
harmony and satisfaction to three years of, of quite um, fraught uh, situation uh, on, in Britain uh, over Brexit and in Ireland as well. Uh, and we, we do have to work on, on rebuilding some of these links and, and, and reassuring people. And then the other thing is, the other thing our government has tried to do to provide reassurance is that it has been quite clear that it does not favour a referendum on Irish unity at this juncture. It takes the view that the matter of Irish unity is dealt with in the Good Friday Agreement and the provisions are there, they're unchanged by this situation <coughs> and that it would be counterproductive to throw the issue of Irish unity into an already fraught situation surrounding Brexit and the implications of Brexit for Northern Ireland. Thank you. I think Andrew wanted to come in as well, did you, on the I, unionist yes. point? Yes, if I may, just the, it's, it goes to the, the way in which this has been perceived uh, and we're very well aware of the, the language in the document and, and there was similar language in the Theresa May draft withdrawal agreement. Uh, there, there is a, a, a deficit of trust at the moment. That's part of the reason that our institutions are not functioning. There's, there's a level of distrust on both sides at the present time and then the, the whole range of, of different views about Brexit colour then the way in which people are reacting now. So some of the Northern Ireland politicians are coming with a scepticism about the deal because they don't want Brexit to happen at all. Uh, that, uh, that's that's one, of, one of the possible reactions. Uh, and then there's the, the DUP who have said the only thing that, that they said consistently, their one thing was for Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK to be treated in exactly the same way. Now, that was never actually pr a practical proposition. So the, the part of the problem is that the way in which N n neither government has actually been able to really convince people of that, that truth. To me, there's, there's a, a, fun a very fundamental fact, which is that in separation of, of the UK from the EU, the land border is not suitable for that purpose at all. There is no way in the world that that could be a proper international frontier. It, it, it came into being in the, the month of my father's birth in May of 1921. It was a county boundary. It's all over the place. Uh, you know, there, there are an, 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 an amazing range of, of anecdotes on the Irish border Twitter handle, which are, are both <laughs> deeply amusing, but also have really penetrating truth. It just doesn't work. Whereas, if, you can, if this can work out in a low-key, pragmatic way, not a dramatic separation of Northern Ireland from Great Britain, but um, there, there's a need for some checks and, and, uh, and, and information being provided to make things work, that's, that's toning the whole debate down, building trust, building restoration. Of that, that's both critical to getting this through and to the restoration of our institutions as well. Thank you. Um, Congressman King, I wanted to bring you in at a point that Senator Murphy raised because he spoke uh, about the importance of the EU, just looking at the, the <coughs> widening out the lens a little bit, uh, to the United States. And one of the things that's been interesting about the Trump administration is it's sort of departed from maybe what um, previous Republican administrations have done about the EU. So the Bush administration was more pragmatic in order to certain degrees of skepticism. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could uh, maybe talk a little bit about whether or not Europe is becoming a partisan issue again and where, from where you sit, you know, how is the EU perceived, particularly amongst Republicans and, and where do you think U.S. policy toward the EU should go. Okay. First, I'm still struck by what Amanda said about Uber drivers in Belfast. <laughs> I go back to the days when they had black taxis lined up for Catholics, black taxis lined up for Protestants, <laughs> and if you went in the wrong cab, you might get killed. I mean, that's how, that's how divided it was. So I can't imagine an Uber driver going from the Falls Road to the Crumlin Road without getting shot. It's, uh, again, it's an indication of how far it's, it's come over there. We're talking about Uber drivers. So that, that has to be kept. Keep the Uber drivers because that's a symbol, again, of this uh, uh, unity that's coming about despite the divisions that are there now. Uh, I, I strongly support NATO. I think there has been within certain countries uh, feeling that the EU has overreached a bit as far as their domestic matters. That's for them to resolve. But I agree with you. I think that an EU, a strong EU and a strong NATO is essential to American security. And I think that's generally the view among uh, Americans, uh, among Republicans. Uh, again, they could have probably 
would be somewhat more critical of certain aspects of the EU than certain Democrats might be, or certain uh, uh, Republican administrations in the past would have been. But if you took a consensus, it would be that we do need strong NATO, and we, whatever problems there are with the EU should be resolved within the EU, and hopefully we can still maintain strong relations. Also, can I give a shout out to Paul Brown here? I know he's, you know, he's a big shout out at Notre Dame right now. But he was, his real fame comes, he was a deputy police commissioner in New York City, so the NYPD. So, Paul, it's good to have you here, and thanks for keeping us safe. Thank you. Um, Senator, I was wondering if we, we could look at, you, you spoke about the EU piece of this. Um, assuming Britain does leave the European Union, I mean, it's possible it won't happen, but let's sort of assume for argument's sake that the deal goes through, whether it's, you know, in November or January or at some point, and Britain has left. Um, what should the United States do in that situation to try to preserve, you know, the special relationship with the UK while also trying to encourage the UK to be close to the EU and then protecting the Northern Ireland piece of this? Like, how should US policy evolve uh, to account for Brexit? Well, I think, you know, the ambassador's point is spot on. There's really no way for this not to accrue ultimately to the economic detriment of the United States. You know, we frankly relied on Britain very often uh, to use its seat at the table inside the European Union uh, to protect interests that we had in common. For instance, on financial sector regulation. Uh, Britain was always uh, the most vocal voice at the table when talking about how to regulate banks and insurance companies and uh, investment funds, and often our interests were aligned. And I think we really do worry about what those conversations will look like inside Europe without the uh, Britain at the table and how that will ultimately affect our uh, company's interests there. So um, we are going to have to, frankly, be um, more active uh, inside uh, European Union discussions have a bigger presence in Brussels than we did before. And it doesn't certainly help to have an ambassador there today who is reported to have uh, <laughs> declared his mission as to destroy uh, the EU because we're going to have to do more to be integrated into the decisions that it's making. I think we'll have some really tough decisions to make in Congress um, because you are right. We are going to want to preserve this special relationship. It is absolutely Britain that answers the call um, uh, before many others uh, when we ask for help in different security initiatives around the world. Um, but I worry uh, about entering into quick negotiations around a bilateral trade agreement because of the signal it would send to others, maybe not next year, but down the line, who may think about leaving the EU uh, as, uh, as well. Um, and so my feeling on, on this matter is that we should be clear that our preference uh, is a trade agreement with the European Union. Now, admittedly, that has stalled for the time being, but uh, I think it's smart for us to uh, say that Britain may uh, ultimately uh, be in line for a trade agreement with the United States, but first, we need to get a deal done with the European Union. And so I think if we think about um, a broader strategy of repairing the damage that's been done under the Trump administration with Europe at large, investing in our diplomacy in Brussels, and ordering trade agreements as a signal to what our you know, where our ultimately our interests lie, uh, I think that would be a good start. Um, it, it is stunning to me that many of the cheerleaders of Brexit were talking about the United States coming to the rescue. I mean, the fact of the matter is, the leverage is going to be on one side of that negotiation. The United States is going to hold all of the cards in, uh, in that deal. And so if folks in Britain are, you know, worried about, you know, American chlorinated chicken landing on their shores, the quickest way to guarantee that is to leave Europe. Um, because uh, you are not going to have a, a lot of ability uh, to stop U.S. interests from prevailing in a trade agreement where um, you need it much more than we need it. Okay, thank you. I, I've always thought, by the way, that the, the, the free trade deal, it's not really in the UK's interest either, right? Because the larger the trade deal is with the US, the smaller the scope there is for a trade deal between the UK and EU. So they have to sequence this in right. a way that's for their larger partner. But Amanda, if I could bring you back in and, and if you could maybe address the same question, but just, you know, obviously President Trump is sort of fairly fixed in his views on, on Brexit, and, you know, he has his good friend Nigel Farage to offer him advice. 
And but let's assume that either he has an epiphany or that there's a different president in the future. What should the United States do uh, assuming that Brexit is sort of a fact? I mean, how does this change? You've worked as a deputy assistant uh, secretary in the State Department on Europe. H how should this change how we think about America's Europe policy? Uh, I would think there's there's a couple of things. One, I to stick with Northern Ireland specifically, I think the U.S. should work to support efforts to get the assembly stood back up as soon as possible. Uh, you know, I think Senator Murphy was very right in the way he characterized the Trump administration's approach to Brexit. Uh, and one of the, the consequences of that is that the U.S. has not played an active role the way it has in the past in terms of supporting policy in Northern Ireland. Uh, administrations of both political parties have consistently had envoys to Northern Ireland. Uh, we had Senator George Mitchell help negotiate the Good Friday Agreement. Richard Haas uh, was very involved in efforts to get the IRA to decommission weapons. Uh, Gary Hart was involved. In, in efforts to prevent the Stormont Assembly from collapsing during the Obama administration. Uh, and in the Trump administration, we had Secretary Tillerson um, telling uh, Chairman Corker at the time uh, that the, the U.S. was retiring that position. Um, the Assembly had, had been stood up at the time. They wanted to save the $50,000. Uh, and so the U.S. has been really absent from a, a critical shuttle diplomacy role that I think it's played in the past on efforts to support a very localized peace in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, it may be that this administration has taken too politicized an approach and put its hand too heavily on one side of the scale uh, to be able to be involved um, in, in that process. But that is something that I think the U.S. historically has done to the benefit of the, the, the process in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, looking more, more broadly at the EU, I, certainly from the, the State Department's perspective, and, and the Senator alluded to this as well, is that the U.K. was always the first port of call for the U.S. in trying to seek to influence uh, EU policy negotiations. We certainly were very like-minded with the UK on a number of issues, on, on economic, on regulatory and trade issues, uh, and certainly on things like sanctions. Uh, sanctions on Russia for the Ukraine violation, sanctions on Iran leading to the, the JCPOA. And so the US is going to have to start thinking through uh, alliances with, with other countries in the EU. I, the US certainly engages bilaterally with, with all of these countries, but in terms of seeking how to influence some of these EU policy debates, uh, uh, the U.S. is is going to have to take an approach uh, on on that. Uh I also think that, that we not need to make this a, a zero sum. I, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross earlier this week was suggesting that the US and the UK should team up together against the European Union. Uh, and I think that's a really problematic attitude. This, <laughs> this should not be zero sum. Uh, the US can have strong and effective relations with the UK, which is still going to remain an active member of NATO. It's going to remain uh, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, and we should continue to have strong and, and important relations with the EU. Uh, so I don't think we should be deciding uh, between the UK government and the Irish government, between the UK and the EU, uh, but really need to find ways to, to work with, with all sides. Thank you. I'm going to go to the audience in a second, but Ambassador, just uh, both Senator Murphy and, and Amanda both sort of said that US policy toward Europe is sort of detrimentally impacted because Britain is not as big an influence in the EU. Would Ireland sort of play that role in the future, or how does Ireland's sort of view of the U.S. relationship with the EU change once Britain is left? Well, look, let me just be clear that I think one of the big losses in Brexit will be the influence of the U.K. around that table in Brussels and Luxembourg when there are EU meetings, because what's happening now, and remember, one of the reasons why British-Irish relations have improved so considerably and steadily over the last 45 years of membership is because we have sat around the same table together day in, day out for 45 years. And we have discovered that we have a lot in common when it comes to economic policy. We tend to be very strongly on the free trade side of the spectrum. We tend to favor uh, smart regulation and so forth. So we have a whole range of, of economic interests that, are, that overlap very substantially with those of the UK and happen also to be interests that are similar to those of the United States. And just let me give you two examples. Um, our finance minister was instrumental in blocking the digital services tax, which had been proposed there um, a couple of years ago, last year, 
and would have detrimentally affected US multinational companies operating in Europe. In fact, it would only, it, it was designed, it would only have affected US companies. And we were initially the only ones opposing that uh, measure. Eventually, we managed to build a coalition which succeeded in blocking uh, the digital services tax. And secondly, we are currently um, engaged in a, a legal case against the European Commission, which has tried to make the Irish government take 13 billion euros in tax from Apple, which in our view does not belong to us, and therefore we refuse to accept it, because we believe that that, that tax actually, that, uh, that uh, money, those Apple resources, which are now in an escrow account, ought to be taxed in the United States. So we have played already a significant role. And remember, on a per capita basis, we have the, the most, we have the deepest and most extensive economic relationship with the US of any country in the European Union. There are 750 US companies in Ireland. The volume of, of trade and investment compared with the size of our country is phenomenally large. And we do expect we can't ever replace Britain. We just don't have the size and the scale to do so. But we certainly will be keen and determined to step up to the plate a bit more actively on this EU-US um, uh, relationship after Britain leaves the European Union. And we are talking to the uh, US State Department and others about how we, can, how we can play a more active role in relation to EU-US relations for the future. Because it's vital for us given the extent of our trade and investment connections with the United States, any damage that's done to the EU-US relationship will be, very, will be particularly and disproportionately damaging for Ireland. For example, the recent uh, uh, tariffs that were imposed in, 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 in retaliation for, for Airbus, even though we have no involvement in the Airbus project, those tariffs will affect Ireland disproportionately. In fact, we will have the, on a, on a per capita basis, the impact on Ireland will be, will be significantly more than any other European country, including the four countries involved in the Airbus dispute. It's a rare politician who'll turn down 13 billion dollars. <laughs> well, our parliament decided to turn it down. <laughs> um, but before we go to the audience, would anyone like to come back in just on the points that the ambassador raised, or should we, should we open it up? I, I, I get at one point, from the perspective of Irish America, I think we should make it clear that we do fully embrace the Good Friday Agreement and that this is not some kind of a scheme to bring about a united island. If that happens on its own, it's only Good Friday, but we shouldn't be trying to act clever about this. I think it's important not to give that impression at all. Great. So we will take three questions um, in a row. Um, please raise your hand, and, and um, I, see, I see people already. So we'll, we'll take a few um, over here. And if you just stand up and, and state your name, and then make sure it's a question and not a comment, so that has a question mark at the end. Uh, so uh, yeah. Um, this question is not strictly on the Irish question, but does anybody in the panel have an opinion on the effect of uh, the potential of a secessionist movement in Scotland? Did you just say your name? Uh, sorry, my name is Glenn Irving. Okay. Um, I think there was someone just behind you, yeah, two rows back. Yeah, my name is... Uh, Pat Malloy. I was Assistant Secretary for Trade at Commerce under President Clinton and was involved in some of these meetings in Northern Ireland uh, to create a better atmosphere up there for unification or for better relations between the North and the South. I'm very surprised to hear, I follow this a bit, and I'm very surprised the fact that Northern Ireland doesn't have a functioning government. I didn't know about that. Can, what is the problem there? Why does Northern Ireland not have a functioning government? How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we have one more gentleman here, and I should point out if you're behind a pillar and I can't see you, just wave or jump up and down and we'll come to you for a question. So, yeah. um, my name is Mark Finlay. Um, I'm privileged to serve as a special advisor on Capitol Hill to Congressman Adderholt and uh, work with uh, members of the Senate and House prayer groups and uh, as 
Ambassador Mulhall knows, we've always worked hard to bring people from all uh, corners of the island together and use that as a great tool to, to encourage. And before I left uh, Belfast uh, seven years ago, I was chairman of South Belfast Partnership Board and deeply involved in the uh, uh, post-conflict uh, transformation that went on. Uh, my concern and my question uh, relates to the parlance of Good Friday Agreement was about confidence building measures. And this process, uh, Andrew referred to the fact that, you know, there has been a, a lack of confidence and a lack of cooperation. What specifically can the administration do in terms of encouraging confidence building measures? Uh, one of those that has been discussed is the, the aspect of a special economic zone. Clearly, de facto, that's already been created in bringing uh, together to uh, the EU and the UK in this uh, special way. Uh, can the US consider overlaying with that a special economic zone status that would include an economic envoy being appointed and perhaps uh, practical initiatives like the extension of US customs clearance, which exists for Dublin and Shannon to the north, and some other similar measure for the Port of Belfast that might allow for the uh, creation of and sustaining of an all Ireland sea link between the Port of Belfast and perhaps Baltimore or something of that nature. I think it's the, the administration um, has been quite quiet on these matters, and my, my question is, what can be done by all parties, both sides of the aisle, to, uh, to really encourage and to deal with the lack of confidence that exists? I could read you the, the quote, the tweet from the Chief of Staff to the former First Minister just this afternoon, and uh, there is a deep lack of confidence that must be addressed. So um, the reason that the, the executive uh, collapsed in January of 2017 was fundamentally about a breakdown in confidence and trust between Sinn Féin and the, and the DUP. Uh, the pretext was uh, an energy scheme that went wrong, which I was personally deeply involved. I've sat for many days in front of the public inquiry into that at work. The real reason is a, a breakdown of trust, the power sharing, in some way wasn't working as, as expected or as envisaged, uh, whether that's uh, Sinn Féin saying that they, they, wor they weren't getting as much out of it uh, as they had hoped. There were some other incidents, Brexit, uh, and the wider economic position, uh, financial position, affected their attitude to it. So uh, there have been many attempts since then to have a restoration, uh, successive secretaries of state have convened talks and they'll do so again. Uh, I think it's hard to see it coming back ahead of a resolution on the, the Brexit question. And if there's a general election, that's another reason for delay. As the, the, the Tonish has said many times, there'll always be an excuse, so let's get on with it. And they tried, yeah. but it's, it, it's, to me, the fundamental is work, making sure that the Good Friday Agreement is truly honored and the elements for me are therefore respect for the principle of consent that no one stays as part of the UK unless and until the majority there change, change that, that they respect genuinely the operation of the North-South institutions, which was the, the quid pro quo for the Irish government accepting partition. For, uh, enormous historical compromises were reached, but they've not been fully honored by anybody. And the difficulty now is that uh, the, uh, in the current parliament, where the UK government is so closely related to one side in Northern Ireland, that makes it pretty tricky to see restoration quickly. But we have to try and, and, and function ahead. And uh, to Mark's questions there, the, the building confidence again is, is, is absolutely vital. Uh, and I have, I have to say, the interventions uh, from uh, the speakers here today and from the visit by the Speaker and, and, and um, Congressman Neil in, in April. The, the commitment that says 
the Good Friday Agreement is owned and respected by the international community, not especially the US. That is a, a, a very positive contribution towards this process and, and, and we, we would want to be, express great gratitude for that. Uh, I'm impartial, so nothing, I'm an impartial civil servant, but I, I have no, no hesitation in expressing loyalty to the Good Friday Agreement because that's our constitution. I, I, I would just say, I think the, the engagement from the United States needs to be sustained. Uh, and part of what builds confidence is knowing that the United States of America, which has been so vital to the, uh, to the, to the peace agreement that is now part of the Constitution, is um, not just with you during temporary visits. Uh, and so, you know, the, it is probably not entirely and completely coincidental that the period in which Stormont has been unable to form a government uh, exists um, uh, at the exact same time where the United States has not appointed any envoy um, in the tradition that Amanda referenced. And so it probably makes sense for us to revisit that conversation. Um, we didn't have an ambassador to Ireland for a very long time. Our ambassador to, uh, to Britain has been focused almost exclusively on the question of helping to manage Britain's withdrawal from the uh, European Union. He has not been involved in a day-to-day -day way in the uh, questions of putting the government back together. We haven't had an assistant secretary for Europe uh, in a very long time, uh, for months and months and months. And so, you know, there's personnel um, from the U.S. side that can make a difference uh, here uh, and appointing really good people, making sure the positions are filled, and perhaps revisiting this question of whether uh, we need a specific representative to uh, once again try to put the two sides back in conversations, uh, I, I think is part of what builds that confidence. And the reality is, um, you know, th there, there is the framework of an agreement that could get um, the DUP and Sinn Féin back uh, into government. It's not as if it's a total mystery as to the kind of things that Sinn Féin would have to agree to, dropping some of their preconditions, uh, what the DUP may have to agree to, perhaps not using some of their um, uh, parliamentary advantages to stop legislation that enjoys majority support from moving forward. You know, th th those, those kind of frameworks uh, are, are there for the taking, and I think deeper, more stable, more consistent U.S engagement is part of what helps build that confidence that may be lacking today. Thank you. Ambassador? Yes. Well, just to say that um, um, the Brexit didn't cause the collapse or the, the uh, suspension or the, the, the um, um, a dissolution of the Northern Ireland executive and the effective stalling of, of the Assembly's work, um, which happened, um, you know, uh, it happened separately for different reasons. But Undoubtedly, Brexit has contributed to the prolongation of that um, um, uh, vacuum, political vacuum in Northern Ireland. And our government and our, I mean, my colleagues in Dublin have been, have been wearing out the road between uh, Dublin and Belfast, continually going up there for, for meetings uh, and trying to engineer some progress between the two sides. But so far, we, we came very close at one stage, um, um, you know, but it didn't. It didn't quite. Uh, didn't quite gel, and, and and therefore we're in this position where, at a vital time when there ought to have been a political leadership in Northern Ireland, focusing on how to figure out what version of Brexit might work for the entire community. That that political leadership simply wasn't there, and it wasn't be, you know, because the institutions weren't uh, uh, weren't up and running. I mean, I can remember early on in the process, just after the referendum, uh, there was a meeting of the British Irish. Council and at that time, uh, the then um, first minister Arlene Foster and uh, our deputy first deputy first minister Martin McGuinness had ha had made a joint submission to the uh, to the British government about uh, you know the special needs of Northern Ireland with regard to Brexit and and I was very encouraged at that time because I thought that's the beginnings of maybe uh, an evolution of, of Northern Irish engagement with the Brexit issue that might result in some 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 positive outcomes but then of course that all you know that all became impossible once the uh, the um, executive um, ceased to operate and we haven't been able to bring it back together again uh, since then the other thing I would say in, in, in I mean in response to mark is that the economic dividend has always been part and parcel of the, the support system for the Good Friday Agreement and its implementation. And it has certainly come about. And by the way, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, 
our deputy prime minister, in in uh, uh, who was interviewed in um, Belfast when he was visiting for the Chamber of Commerce dinner, made the point that jobs may move from Ireland, from the uh, from the south to the north, because of this Brexit deal. In other words, there could be job losses in that companies may find that there could actually be an advantage to moving some of their operations north of the border because Northern Ireland will have this special set of arrangements only applying in Northern Ireland, which will give Northern Ireland an advantage over uh, companies south of the border. So we already recognise that, that <coughs> this deal is designed to give Northern Ireland an economic benefit and designed to ensure that that economic dividend continues to be felt in Northern Ireland and, uh, and thereby provides a vital support for the Good Friday Agreement and its implementation. Congressman King, and then we'll, we'll move to Amanda. You might, Amanda, address Scotland in a minute, but Congressman King? Yeah, on the question of the economic zone, a special economic arrangement now, I think maybe something we should look at. We have to be very, very careful because that, again, could have political overtones. Uh, and I'm, now I'm uh, being more concerned about actually the North and South here, how they would look upon that. Are they going to be treated more differently from uh, you know, the rest of Britain doing that. In other words, it could be economically advantageous, but it could uh, create more of a political divide. So I think you know, they're going to have a hard enough time adjusting to the post-Brexit era uh, without the U.S. trying to impose or get involved in economic. I think it's something to be discussed behind the scenes, but I'd be very reluctant to do that too quickly without creating more of a climate that we're trying to rush toward the United Island, that we're trying to separate the North more from Britain. Again, it could you know, be misinterpreted. But again, I'm just thinking out loud right now. But I think you know, it's best that we sort of sit back and let Brexit take its toll, this post-Brexit era, hopefully if an agreement comes about. So Amanda, if Brexit ever finishes, we might be faced with, I don't know, Scotset or Scotland exiting uh, the UK. Is that, are we likely to face that, do you think, now that Scotland may find itself out of the EU? Uh, so I'm... I, if I like to talk about anything more than Brexit, is talking about Scottish politics. Uh, before I moved to Belfast, I did my PhD uh, in Edinburgh, looking at the relationship of the Scottish Parliament and the European Union. So if nothing else, it's nice when your PhD is relevant 20 years later. <laughs> um, and I actually met the ambassador at the time when he opened up Ireland's first consulate in Edinburgh and served as the consul general. So I don't think either of us thought 20 years later we'd be sitting on a stage in, in Washington uh, <laughs> talking about this. Uh, so uh, I, and also one, one final point. Blog, I uh, wrote a report for, for Brookings um, last year looking at the implications of Brexit for the larger constitutional settlement in the UK, looking specifically at uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Because I, I do think one of the potential long-term consequences of Brexit uh, is the question of, of Irish unification, as we've been talking about, and also the possibility of, of Scottish independence. Uh, so you might remember that Scotland had a referendum in 2014 on the question of independence, and it lost. Uh, immediately after the Brexit referendum, there was a, a spike in enthusiasm in Scotland for revisiting the, the question of, of independence. Uh, Scotland voted 63% uh, to remain in the European Union with majorities in all constituencies in Scotland. Uh, so certainly very different attitudes in Scotland about the question of Brexit than what we saw in other places. Uh, opinion polls since then do not show uh, dramatically different results than what we saw in the 2014 referendum. Uh, there has been some growth of support uh, for independence, but not overwhelmingly. And it's been difficult for the Scottish government for the Scottish National Party uh, to work out this question of, of when you would hold a second independence referendum, uh, which is certainly something that the Scottish National Party is still committed to and, and something that it is looking at. Uh, but there is this, this issue of timing. Uh, there's a couple factors, I think, that play into this. One, I think people are sick of voting. Uh, if you've lived in Scotland, you voted in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum, the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum. You voted in general elections in uh, 2017. It looks like you're going to vote in more general elections. And you had local elections and European Parliament elections earlier this year. So that's a lot of voting. Uh, second, it shows that referenda do not definitively answer political questions. We're talking about a second Brexit referendum. We're now talking about a second Scottish independence referendum. Uh, third, everybody has now seen that divorce is really hard. Uh, and if you're trying to get divorced after a 40-year relationship, how much more complicated is it going to be to get divorced after a 300-year relationship? Wow. 
There's broader questions about whether London would even have the bandwidth right now to handle uh, divorce negotiations with Scotland on top of what they're dealing with now. I, one of my, my favorite uh, telling statistics on Brexit is there are over 16,000 civil servants in London focusing purely on Brexit-related issues, which that's 16,000 people that are not thinking about climate change in Iran and transportation policy and everything else. So not a lot of bandwidth there to also negotiate a divorce with, with Scotland. The final issue is that the debate over Northern Ireland and the border shows that you're going to have similar challenges between Scotland and England if Scotland voted to rejoin the European Union once it achieved independence. You wouldn't have the existential issues that you have in Ireland because you don't have the post-conflict nature there. Uh, but certainly if for 300 years your sheep and, and people have been wandering across a border, it's going to be very inconvenient to suddenly have to start imposing customs checks there. So I think this is something we could potentially see. Uh, but I think we've got a lot to get through with Brexit first before there's the bandwidth and potentially a sufficiently decisive move in political attitudes. Thank you. Well, I think you'll be kept well busy uh, if Scotland does um, vote again. So we've time for one more uh, round, and I would strongly encourage any of the students who are here as well to, to weigh in, because I know you, you talked to Amanda earlier on. Uh, but I have a woman here in the middle and then a gentleman here and then a woman down the, the back. And if you could keep it very brief, because we only have about five or six uh, minutes. And as you see, we have five terrific panelists. So, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Brittany Gibson. I'm with the American Prospect magazine. Uh, my question is about the current um, iteration of the deal, which people have said would put a border in the Irish Sea. Uh, you mentioned that might not be a good faith interpretation of this agreement. Um, so I wanted to have that elaborated on. And if that is true, then the DUP not supporting the deal, uh, how do you view that? Is that problematic? Thank you. I think the woman, about three or four rows behind you, and then the gentleman over here. Um, my name is Catherine Fines, and I'm a student at Notre Dame. Um, over the summer, Sean Fay had started saying that a Brexit, especially a no-deal Brexit, would lead to votes regarding the reunification of Ireland. And there were talks that, or reports that Boris Johnson was firmly against it. And I was just kind of wondering the opinion of both sides on that. Thank you. My name's um, uh, Dominic Bryan. I'm an academic at Queen's in Belfast, um, a resident of North Belfast, and also um, involved in some of the talks up at, at um, Stormont. And one of the concerns about this whole process has to be the fears that people have on the streets in Northern Ireland. It's been mentioned to people up here. And, and what the deal looks like to me is, is, a, is um, something that hasn't got mentioned much, but in the 70s and 80s, people used to talk about joint authority. All right, that you could come up with some joint authority. And the, the difficulty with this deal, and I would have been dead against referenda, um, I was a Remainer and all of that sort of thing, is that the structures set up look a little bit like joint authority, ironically sort of joint authority with Europe rather than joint authority with Ireland. And that will fill, that will be used by unionists to fulfill fears. All right, whether some of us like it or not. So I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on how you deal with the fears that unionists have around that sort of sovereignty issue. Great, thank you. So we, we're out of time, basically. So we have time maybe for reactions from the panelists to any one of these questions you choose, uh, just very briefly, or just general um, reflections. And uh, maybe we'll start in, in reverse order than we started. So Amanda, if you'd like to... Uh, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to let the, the ambassador and, and Andrew take, take some of the, the specifics of these. I mean, on the, the question of the, the, the border poll, um, I think, you know, the, the ambassador laid out the position of, of the Irish government um, on this. I think the UK government is, is not necessarily supportive of this at the moment. I, but frankly, there's not currently a majority of people in Northern Ireland that are actually in favor of changing 
the constitutional status of, of Northern Ireland. Uh, so the Good Friday Agreement lays out a provision that once it is clear that there is a majority, uh, the, the British government Secretary of State for Northern Ireland needs to bring forward a, a border poll to, to look at, at these issues. Uh, I think one of the concerns that, that people have had watching the situation in Northern Ireland is that some opinion polls are showing uh, the potential for some increasing support in this. And I think that was potentially around issues related to a hard Brexit, where you would likely have a hard border imposed on, on the island of, of Ireland. Uh, and I think also getting to the question about some of the unionist concerns, there is a worry that if you have significant deviation between Northern Ireland from the rest of Great Britain, that that will simply increase momentum and support for, for unification. Uh, so I don't think this is something that we are likely to see in the near term, uh, but certainly from the unionist perspective, uh, it is concern about something that could continue to grow over, over time. Uh, and so I think however this deal plays out, there is gonna be the, the need to, to try and assure that some of the, the unionist concerns are addressed uh, and that the Northern Ireland Assembly is involved in these various mechanisms that are being set up, including the Joint Committee, to oversee how this protocol for Northern Ireland would operate. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, an immense amount of work was done to try to make something that was pragmatically effective in relation to the, the relationship between Northern Ireland and uh, both the EU on the one hand and, and, and the, the land border and maintaining the, the, its position in the UK. So. If, if the land border is open, and it has to be open, that, that's, that's the thing everyone recognizes, that there is no possibility or, or acceptability to controls at the land border, then that means that goods can move back and forth. So therefore, the Euro European side have to say there have to be sufficient protections. That means some degree of checking, especially on agri-food products, to stop bad things getting into the EU and circulating through, through the EU. That's a totally understandable uh, technical requirement. On the other hand, then, uh, we, we need to avoid a tariff barrier or customs barrier between Northern Ireland and, and, the, and the rest of the UK. So th what is there is something that manages, seeks to manage that risk. It's a, a, that there's a lot of detailed, clever work in there, but clever work doesn't easily translate into something that is politically obviously acceptable and that then plays to the kind of concerns. If people choose to be concerned, then they can find things to be concerned about. But there are also uh, real reassurances that this is, uh, what, what is it that makes a country? There are, are uh, is it the case that some checking of the movement of goods it makes, a, makes a barrier that is really significant? The, the way this will work is that certain goods will have the right to move between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, but because there are other goods that don't have that right, then there's a need for some information. Information checking can be done in a, a light touch way. It's also practically easier to do it at a port. You've got to put a manifest together to get on a ship. So adding to that information in as simple and straightforward way as possible, does that create a border? That's a political judgment. Uh, and the, the skill and the, ob the, the requirement now is to, is to see, well, what is ultimately going to be politically acceptable? Yeah, just, uh, one final thought, as you mentioned, uh, Queen's University, which again brought back to me some of the horrors of Northern Ireland. I met with Edgar Graham, who was a professor mm -hmm. at Queen's University, a month before he was assassinated. So, I mean, again, the fact that you're here from Queen's University and able to talk about it without having to worry about what's going to happen to you is, again, an example of how far we've come. I think as, as an Irish American or as an American member of Congress or in the government, what we can mainly do is uh, uh, contribute our rhetoric to make it clear that this is not a victory lap, this is not a victory dance that we are committed, as committed to the unionist community as we are to the Republican or nationalist community, and that was the essence of the Good Friday Agreement. What may happen 5, 10, 15, 25 years ago is up to the people in the North to decide, and we shouldn't be encouraging it either way other than to allow the agreement to go forward. So we have to watch, uh, again, our rhetoric on this. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Well, I, I guess I would just come back and underscore something that Representative King said with respect to, you know, the uh, a vote that may ultimately take place regarding the future of 
uh, of Ireland, from our perspective, the United States supports the Good Friday Agreement and supports this decision being made in Northern Ireland, um, not under crisis. Uh, and so the reason why many of us wanted to make sure that that border wasn't put back up was that for the long-term uh, health of, of Ireland, Northern Ireland, of U.S.-Ireland relations, uh, it was better off that this decision uh, about the future constitutional status of Northern Ireland uh, be done uh, not because of a, 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 an economic imperative that was foisted uh, upon uh, the voters in that referendum uh, from outside uh, entities. And so in that respect, though, I opened with um, my skepticism about uh, Britain's departure from uh, the EU as it relates to U.S. national security interests. I, I think it certainly accrues to, to our benefit and the, the benefit of uh, Northern Ireland to be able to make that choice whenever it comes without an economic gun to their head. Thank you. Ambassador, final word? Yeah, I, th I think we, we need to uh, de-dramatize uh, the situation. Um, I mean, I, the, the, the agreement does not make any reference, the agreement between the UK and the, and the EU does not make any reference to a border in the Irish Sea. It talks about arrangements. Uh, our, our minister speaking in Belfast talked about administrative arrangements. And the whole purpose of this is that, that if you have a European single market to which Ireland belongs, and if Northern Ireland has a special relationship with that single market through this agreement, if you have a European customs union which Britain is outside of, but Northern Ireland is, is, has, has a special arrangement to be part, effectively, of that customs uh, union with the consent of, of the uh, Northern Ireland Assembly, then you have to do something to protect the integrity of the single market, the European single market. Nobody, the agreement makes it quite clear that goods that are going from the UK, from Britain to Northern Ireland, for consumption in Northern Ireland are not affected by these arrangements, right? So we're talking about how to identify those things that might be destined to go into the European Union. They will have to meet single market standards and will have to abide by the rules of the customs union. Otherwise, the single market, the European single market would be undermined. Now, now the view of this, I mean, I mean, if you read the protocol, and we have certain advantages here. First of all, there will be, if this agreement is approved, there'll be at least a year and maybe two years of a transition period during which the, the British government, the EU, can look at mm -hmm. trade between Britain and Northern Ireland to see what exactly is at stake here. And the agreement seems to point towards the lightest possible set of arrangements uh, with the, so, so to call it a border, a border raises notions in people's minds of passports being checked, and there is no question of that. Um, it, the agreement makes it quite clear that, that, that individuals traveling back and forth will not be subjected to any, uh, to any customs checks. So we're talking here about, about, about a, a, a system to ensure that the single market is not undermined by the open border on the island of Ireland, which means some kind of check on, on goods coming from, from Britain to Northern Ireland. But I, I think to, to refer to it as a border is, I think, a misuse of you know, the term border. And I hope that we can de-dramatize this and that people will become accustomed and that these, these administrative arrangements, as our minister called them, will not, even be, will not be visible to anybody other than the uh, people directly involved, the hauliers and, and the companies that are sending goods uh, from Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, finally, just before I finish, it would be remiss of me not to pay tribute to, to our, our friends in Irish-American organizations, especially to the um, ad hoc committee uh, for the defense or for the protection of, of the Good Friday Agreement, because I have found certainly over the last two years here that Irish-America have been extremely uh, concerned about the implications of um, Brexit for Northern Ireland, for the border, and for the peace process, and determined not to see the gains of the last 20 years lost because of Brexit. And I, I, I do want to, to acknowledge the, um, you know, the contribution made by members of Congress, by, by people in Irish-American organizations all over the country. I've spoken to many, many groups, and 
every time I've spoken, I've got the same impression, a palpable uh, anxiety about the potential risks that Brexit poses to peace in Ireland. And I hope that um, our, 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 our friends in America will be able to be reassured if we can somehow get this agreement over the line and can start to, 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 um, uh, to go back to a, a more a harmonious, a more constructive and cooperative atmosphere on the island of Ireland and between Britain and Ireland with Brexit out of the way. Thank you very much. I promise I'll be brief. Um, you don't want to stand between people in the bar. Um, but before I do, first, two, two brief announcements. The first is uh, we're going to have a reception, and at that reception, we're going to be joined by the acting chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, who's going to be offering some brief remarks at 6.30, so please do stay for that. The second announcement has to do with Michigan State. Um, Amanda here had a few misgivings, didn't think she was going to receive a fulsome welcome because she comes from Michigan State. Of course, this week, Notre Dame's playing Michigan. And so, for this week anyway, she's a member of the tribe. Just think of some of the words that we've been using tonight. Backstop, Brexit, hard border, Good Friday. We live in a world that is bound and increasingly spellbound by these buzzwords, and particularly how they've shifted, how they've changed, but more troublingly in lots of ways, how they've twisted and how they've tangled. I would dare say one of the few constants that I know of in through this whole thing has been Dan Mulhall. Dan probably doesn't remember, but the first time I met him, it was in Liverpool just after the Brexit vote. We were having a drink, and this is what he said to me. We did not want this to happen. <laughs> and indeed, that's what he said tonight. He has not changed. I think another important constant has been the constructive role that the US has historically played in brokering Irish peace and in mediating the Irish and British relationship. But as we've heard this evening, constants are the exception. Troubling flux seems to be the rule. Now, I'm sorry if I'm a killjoy, because for those of us in the academy, people who teach like me, Brexit is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Things becoming interesting in ways you cannot predict. And when it comes to Ireland especially, Brexit, for those of us in the United States who study Ireland, has frankly been good for business. Now, I'm sorry, though, if I'm glib, because Brexit, as we've heard tonight, has and will continue to create uncertainty, reveal tensions between nations, and especially reveal tensions in the North. What we have discussed here will have real-world effects and far-reaching effects, none of which we cannot predict, except for this. The future will be challenging. It will confound us in ways we can't anticipate, but it will also offer unforeseen opportunities and possibilities that we can't predict this evening. Now, I'm sorry if I'm being a little banal with these comments, but this is what history teaches us. Things will happen and things will change in ways we can't anticipate. History is about contingencies, those little things upon which the big things in life turn. Now, I'm sorry if I'm being philosophical, but we also have to recognize that history and the future involve the ways that people order and try to make sense of these contingencies, these little things. This process of people trying to make sense of flux creates nations, it sustains peace, it can also destroy nations and lead to violence. So what we've talked about tonight matters a great, great deal. This is one in a series of talks we at Notre Dame have been and will be sponsoring on the future of Ireland on both sides of the ocean. So I'll leave you with this. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more changes in this all too fluid world of Ireland and Brexit. And stay tuned also for more Notre Dame events on the future of Ireland. Thank you all very much. Good to see you. Thank you, you too. Thank you for your support all along. Yeah. By the way, it's not going to end. Yeah, no. No, that's right. Stay tuned is right. I, I, I mean, remember that, that, that 